Dr. Salt, you can go ahead. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Andre Swartz. I lecture at the University of Johannesburg. Um, I've been lecturing at the University of Johannesburg in the maths department since January 2016. And every year I'm involved in some way or other in one of the calculus modules for the first year mathematics program. Um, so I've been I've been asked to talk about one of the topics that you as a matriculant will encounter in your first year at university um, studying mathematics, um, which I think, by the way, is a really good initiative. I think it is well worth your time getting a little bit of a heads up um, in terms of what it is that you will cover if you do a, a first year course in mathematics at university. Um, um, almost all of those courses at university level in first year um, cover about 90% of that of such a module is calculus um, at almost all the universities. And today I will be talking about a concept called continuity. So um, this is the idea of a continuous function. And um, it is something that is central to all of calculus. So at this stage, I'm going to assume that at this stage, I'm going to assume that um, you are familiar with the concept of a function and with the concept of the limit of a function. Now, um, you may or may not have covered these concepts in previous talks this week. Um, it doesn't really matter because I do know that you do get introduced to these concepts in um, grade 12 and grade 11, if I'm correct. So it will definitely not be the first time you encounter them. Um, I will not go into the detail explaining what those concepts are because we will build on what you know already. So we will talk about um, continuous functions and it turns out that continuity of a function is probably one of the most useful properties that a function can have. So a large part of the effort that we spend in the first few weeks of, of calculus at, in, in Mathematics 1 is to introduce you to all the notions so that we can get to this point of talking about what we mean when we talk of a continuous function. And, and so at, at school level, um, the concept of continuity is often introduced in an intuitive way by saying that a function f is continuous at a point in its domain if we can draw the graph of that function through that point without lifting our pen off the paper. And this is a good intuitive notion. It, it is in a sense exactly what we mean by a function being continuous at a point. But it is unfortunately just intuitive. And so in mathematics, obviously we need to be able to express things in a more rigorous and a more, um, um, uh, in a more rigorous way. And usually that rigor um, is represented by having some kind of equation and that's what we will talk about today. And we'll see how, how rigor allows us to make the, this conversation around continuity very, very exact, right? Um, it turns out that this notion of continuity is something that we see every day, right? So the idea of, of continuity is that 
we, we are talking about processes that where change is gradual. So a continuous process is one where a small change in an input variable produces only a small change in an output variable. So we can't have any abrupt changes, right? So, so you might think about how, how a person grows, how you get taller over the years. You don't go from being um, a meter tall to a meter and 10 centimeters tall in an instant. No, that 10 centimeter growth will occur gradually over, let's say, a two year period. And this is the notion of con continuity. And that actually continuous processes are all around us. Okay, so that's our introduction. So let's, let's get to the meat and potatoes of what we are talking about. What do we mean by continuous function mathematically? So we will say that a function f is continuous at a number a if the following happens. If the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f at a, right? And, that, and this is what we mean. This is how we have now taken this intuitive notion of continuity and made it precise, right? A function f is going to be, we're going to say that a function f is continuous at a number a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to f at a. So look at the, look at the, the symbol on the right-hand side of the equation of the equal, equal sign there, the f of a. Notice that f of a is really just the value of the function at this input, um, input variable or the value a, right? So a goes in, f of a is whatever the value of the function is at that point. So this equation is saying to calculate what the, to know the limit as x approaches a of f of x, all we have to do is to calculate the value of the function at a. And we'll see in a little bit um, how this does not happen for certain functions. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so if you think about if you think about what we've expressed in that equation, then we really need this function if to satisfy three things at the same time. The first of these is that f at a exists. In other words, that this thing on the right-hand side is well-defined. In other words, that a is in fact in the domain of f. So I will remind you very quickly what we mean by this, uh, this concept of the domain of a function. Remember that a function is a rule that allocates for each input value and output value. So these input values all come from a, from a particular set called the domain of f, right? And this first condition is that the value of the function at a is defined or in fact that a is in the domain of f. So if it's the case that f is, f is continuous at a point a, then a must be in the domain of f. That's what we say. The second condition is that the limit exists. So I'm hoping that you would have seen in the past that limits do not always exist. And a little bit later, we'll see conditions under which they don't exist. So the second condition here is that the expression on the left evaluates to something that does exist. So the limit as x approaches a of f of x does in fact exist. And then finally, the third condition says that not only must these two things exist separately, the limit as x approaches a of f of x must exist, f at a must exist or 
to put it in a different way, A must be in the domain of F. But the third condition is also required that these two things are actually equal. The point here is it is possible that the limit exists, the thing on the left-hand side of the equality, that A is indeed in the domain of F, but that the two are not equal. And we will see examples where that happens as well. And so if you think about these three conditions here, they are exactly the three things that can go wrong when a function, in fact, is not continuous at a particular point. Okay, let's have a look at a, let's have a look at um, first a diagram that illustrates this notion of continuity, and then we will go back to the slide that I've just skipped and talk about what happens when, when um, a function f is not continuous at a point a. So look at this picture. Here we are, I'm trying to show you what it looks like when a function is continuous. So our input comes from the x coordinate, uh, the x axis. So there is the point a on the x axis, right? What we are saying is, in calculating this limit, the limit as x approaches a of f of x, we are letting these x values approach a either from the right-hand side or from the left-hand side. That's what these two red arrows are indicating. Now, when we do that, what's happening is, notice, notice that the graph of the function here is given in blue. Notice that as I approach as the x value approaches the value a on the x on the x axis, what's happening is the point that is traced out on the graph of the function follows this red arrow, and it gets closer and closer to that red dot there. We can reflect what's happening on the graph as points on the y axis, right? And when we do that, then these points f of x approach f of a. And this, this, um, this approaching of f of a by f of x happens whether the x values are larger than a or smaller than a. So, so from the top here, we can let x approach a by making the x, x values successively smaller and smaller and smaller and get closer to A. Or we can start at a point here where the initial X value is smaller than A and the X values in fact increase in size until they, and as they get closer and closer to A. Doesn't matter which one we do. If the function is continuous at A, then what's going to happen is these F of X values will approach F of A over there, right? And on the graph, we will see the points being generated, getting successively closer to that point there. And again, this picture illustrates for you this intuitive notion of, of continuity as being, as the graph being such that you don't have to pick up your pen as you trace the, the, the graph of the function. Okay, so. Obviously, if, if I said earlier, if we understand, if we really understand what it means for a function to be continuous at a point A, then it means we must understand for uh, what it means for a function to be not continuous at a point A. And when that happens, we've got a term. The term we use is discontinuous. So when a function is continuous, at a, when a function is not continuous at A, we will say that the function is discontinuous at A, or we will say that F has a discontinuity at A, okay? And again, continuity has this implication that a small change in X produces only a small change in F of X, right? Okay, let's continue. Let's look at an example, okay? So here we have the graph of a function F, and we will discuss the points at which the, um, the points 
the x values at which the graph is not continuous or is in fact discontinuous, where the function is discontinuous. Okay, so three points stand out. The first one is the point x equals one. The second is the point x equals three. The third is the point x equals five. Now, these kinds of diagrams are commonly used in, in calculus one modules. And the first thing you need to do is to understand the drawing notation here. So if you look at, if you look at the point x equals one, and you look at where, at what happens at x equals one on the graph of that function, you'll notice that at this point here, we've got this sort of um, small circle that doesn't contain its interior. So it, it's just a circle. Um, there isn't a dot there. It's sort of an unfilled circle. I'm never quite sure how to refer to that. Um, in contrast to that, you can look at the point x equals three. There we've got above it, again, a, a, a sort of a circle that doesn't have its, in, its, its inside colored. Um, and below it, you have a, an actual circle, but now the inside is, is completed, right? It's, it's a fold circle. And the same thing is happening at five. So on the graph, it's got an unfold circle. A little bit above it, you've got this fold circle. Now, what does this mean? To understand the example, you, you need to first understand what this means. Now, the thing that's happening at one, what it means is this function is not defined at one. So you, you understand that um, when I draw, when we draw the graph of a function, let's, let's look at the point two. To get the value of the function or to get a rough idea of the value of the function at two, remember what we do. We move vertically up from the input point until we hit the function. Then we move horizontally across until we hit the y-axis. And roughly that's where the value of this function at two will be. Now, in the case for one, in, in the case of x equals one, we don't have a point where we can cut off because, because that circle is unfold. That's what it means. It means that one is not in the domain of f. Now look at three. In the case of three, we actually do have three being in the domain of f. However, notice we can either go up and go across there, or we can go down, hit the curve, the graph of the function and go across. So the fact that that one is unfilled means that the place to read off the value of the function is at the other one, the one that's filled. So to get the value of the function at three, we go down, go across, similarly for five. On the curve here is not where the function is defined, rather the value of the function is there. Right, now having, now you've got an understanding of what these kinds of curves, this, these fold and unfold circles mean. Let's continue with the, um, with the example. So here we have a discontinuity when a is equal to one. Why? Because the graph isn't defined there, right? The function isn't defined there. Remember, we had three conditions that a function must satisfy at a point where it is continuous. I'll scroll back and show you. So the first one was, if it is defined, that is A is in the domain of F. In other words, this equation is true. The limit as X approaches A of F of X is F of A, means the following three things must be true. And the first one is that F of A is defined there. The second is that the limit exists. The third is that the limit equals the value of the function at that point. So in our case, in our example one, <clears throat> the thing that's going wrong here at the point a equals one is exactly that the value that the function is not defined at that point. And so this function is not continuous 
um, at the point x equals one. What about the point x equals three? Well, here something else goes wrong. Here the limit doesn't exist. So remember, when in calculating that limit on the left hand side, we could we could approach, we could let the x values approach three either from the right or from the left. Now, when the x values approach three from the left, from the right, as my hand is indicating there, then the limit of the function is approaching. Then the limit is this value here, sort of where the fingers of that little hand cut the, the y-axis. Whereas if the x coordinates of a point are approaching three from the left, then the limit is here. And because the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, the limit itself doesn't exist. And at the point three, the rule that is broken is the second condition of continuity. This one here, this doesn't exist at the point where x is equal to three. And now you can guess, <clears throat> you can guess what's going to, to go wrong at the point where f of x is equal to, uh, where x is equal to five. In this case, the limit from the, from the right and the limit from the left are both equal to this point here. So the limit exists, but the value of the function is to be read off there, according to my explanation of what these dots and hollow circles mean, right? And so in that case, condition three isn't satisfied. And this function f, for which we've drawn the graph here, is not continuous at these points, x equals one, x equals three and x equals five. Notice that it's continuous everywhere else. So it is, for example, continuous at the point x equals two. It is continuous at the point x equals four, at the point x equals four and a half, at 3.75 and so on and so on and so on. The points where it is, the points where it is not continuous are the points x, x equals one, x equals three and x equals five. Okay. <clears throat> and so f is discontinuous at five. Let's look at another example. Show that the function f of x is equal to x cubed plus three times x squared is continuous at every real number a. So um, I I had a quick look at the topics earlier this week, and I do remember seeing that someone discussed with you the limit laws. And so these limit laws will allow us to calculate um, the, the limit as x approaches a of f of x for this particular function f of x. And, and here we go. We say the limit as x approaches a of f of x is the limit as x approaches a of x cubed plus three times x squared which is equal to, now one of the limit laws says, if I have the sum of two functions like this, then I can split the calculation of the limit of the sum into the sum of the limits. So, so this expression becomes the limit as x approaches a of x cubed plus three times the limit as x approaches a of x squared. And we know that these, these expressions x cubed, right, are, and x squared are in fact continuous. And so we can simply plug in the values there. But this is the same as just calculating the original function. In other words, this is just the value of that function at the point A. And in fact, we've shown that for any um, real number A, the, the limit as x approaches a of f of x is f of a, and so f is continuous at every number a. Let's look at another example. Here we look at four different functions, and we will look at various ways in which these functions, uh, points at which these functions are continuous and not continuous. Again, um, our template for checking continuity and discontinuity will be those three conditions. 
So let's look at the first function. f of x is equal to the one in a. f of x is equal to x squared minus x minus two divided by x minus two. Now, um, you are well aware by now of the fact that division by zero is not allowed, right? Um, it, it leads to nonsensical things when we, when we attempt to divide by zero. And so this function, purely by looking at the way it's, uh, at its expression, I know that this function cannot have a value when x is equal to two. Because when x is equal to two, the denominator is zero. So whatever else I calculate in the numerator, if x is equal to two, this expression will force me to, to divide a number by zero. And so f at two is not defined, two is not in the domain of the function, and so f must be discontinuous at two. It turns out that this function is actually continuous for all other numbers, right? Let's look at the next one. Again, for the same algebraic reason, right? This, um, this expression here is meaningless when x is equal to zero. And so this function is defined in pieces. It's defined in two pieces. It's also referred to as a piecewise defined function. And you will encounter many of these in your first year calculus module. So one over x squared is equal to, or, so, or the function has the value one divided by x squared when x is not zero, and it's one when x is zero, right? So let's look at this. Yeah, obviously the second line here means the function is defined. So the function is defined when x equals zero, but the limit, as x approaches zero of f of x is, is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of one over x squared does not exist, right? So what's happening here is as I make x become closer and closer to zero, this expression becomes very large. So you can think of it as suppose x is one, right? Then x squared is one and one divided by one is one. Now, in order for me to make x closer to zero, I need to go to, let's say, a half. A half is 0 0.5, right? 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25. One divided by 0 0.25 is going to be 25 divided by 100, right? And you can see this, the, these numbers are going to get larger and larger and larger. If x is equal to a tenth, it's one over um, one over ten squared is one over a hundred. One over that it's going to be a hundred. So when x is equal to one over ten, the output of the function is going to be a hundred. Right? When x is one over one hundred, even closer to zero, the output of the function is going to be ten thousand. Right? And you can play around with those numbers and what you'll find is it doesn't matter whether I approach x from, from smaller values, values smaller than zero or values larger than zero, as long as I'm going closer to x, this expression one over x squared is going to become rapidly very, very large, positive. And so that limit doesn't exist. It doesn't get closer and closer to some number. And so f is discontinuous at this point, x equal to zero. Look at number three, right? In three, we've taken, we've, we've kind of fixed the, the problem with a. So in, in, in c, we've taken the same expression as we had in a, but we've given the function of value when x is equal to two, we said, this is the value of the function whenever x is not two. And when x is two, we, we make it equal to one. Let's see what happens there. 
Here, f of t is defined and its value is one. And we can calculate this limit. We can say the limit as x goes to two of f of x is the limit as x goes to two of this expression. We can factor in the numerator and we can cancel the x minus two in the denominator. And now we can see that the limit as x goes to two of x plus one is three. However, the value of the function we've said at two must be one. And so the limit is not equal to the value of the function. And so this function is not continuous at um, x equals two. Okay, it is discontinuous at two. That last function, h, is called the heavy side function. It's named after um, the electrical engineer Oliver Heaviside. And it's usually used to model an electric current that is turned on at time t equal to zero. We'll see in a minute, we'll see graphs of these functions. And so the limit as t approaches zero from below of h of t is zero, and the limit as t approaches zero from above of the heavy side function is one. And again, the limit at zero can't exist because the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right. And so the heavy side function is discontinuous at zero. And that's what the graphs of these functions look like. So there's the first one. Notice the little hole in the curve for the first one, the function in A. It's got a hole there. It means two is not in the domain of the function. There's the behavior I was describing earlier. As x becomes closer and closer to zero, the value of the function shoots up very large positive, whether I approach it from the left or whether I approach it from the left or whether I approach it from the right, right? It's defined to be one when x is zero. Um, this function is discontinuous at zero. There's the heavy side function, the limit, as x approaches, in this case is t approaches zero from above, that's one. The function gets closer to this value here. And the limit as t approaches zero from below is zero, because it's zero everywhere, right? Okay. Um, these, there are different kinds of discontinuities here. So, if you look at the discontinuity at z at uh, for the function a and for the function c, then we can simply if we if we simply define the value of the function to be a an appropriate value. So here we can simply say, well, how about we let the value of the function coincide with that point there, right? And in c, the same thing. Whatever that expression gives it at x equals two, whatever this line is at x equals two, let the function have that value. If that happens, then we've removed the discontinuity when x is equal to two. And because of that, we refer to these kinds of discontinuities as removable. It's easy to remove the discontinuity. The discontinuity at for b, um, cannot be removed. And that kind of discontinuity is called an infinite discontinuity. Infinite because the value of the function becomes very large positive. When that happens, we talk about this notion of, of infinity, right? Um, and then the last one, um, the one for the heavy side function is referred to as a jump discontinuity, right? Functions like these where the value of the function over an interval is often the same, are often referred to as step functions. And we'll see another example of a step function a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, so like I said earlier, physical phenomena are usually continuous. The displacement of velocity of a vehicle varies continuously with time, right? As does a person's height. So if you're driving on the freeway, 
you cannot go from one instant of driving 100, 100, 100 kilometers an hour and in an instant go to 150 kilometers an hour. The world, you know, cars don't work that way. You have to go through 101 kilometers an hour, then 101 and, and a half kilometers an hour, and so on. You go through all those in, through the all those intermediate numbers, right? Um, how we grow as human beings. These are continuous processes. However, having said that, there are natural processes that occur in the world. Um, and we will look at biological systems as examples where, where this happens. So if you look at, at the curve in front of you now, we are representing the number of robins. A robin is a kind of bird in a particular community or in a particular um, population of birds, right? So this, what this graph maps here on the x-axis or on the t-axis is days. So there's day one, day two, day three, and so on, right? And this can carry on however long our experiment, our counting experiment um, happens. And on the p-axis here, we've got the number of individuals. So at time t equals zero, we've got 25 birds in this community. The number of birds in um, stays at 25 for two days. Then at day two, during day two, um, maybe we've got a, a bird that hatches from an egg. And now we've got an additional bird. Right, now we've got 26 birds. The same thing happens in, on day three, where we've got two birds hatching and so on. So yeah, on day four, it could be that three of the birds flew out of the community or three of the birds died. And now we've got only 24 birds left. So the point here is that we've got these jump discontinuities at, at each of these points, right? So at, on day two, we've got a jump discontinuity when the, where the number of birds jumps from um, 25 to 26, on three from 26 to 28, and then from 28 to 24 on day four, and so on. Okay. Um, here's another example from a biological system. Intensive harvesting of a population, such as occurs for certain fish species, <clears throat> can cause what is called population extinction, when we don't have any of those animals left anymore. How this extinction occurs depends on the nature of how we harvest. So, for example, we could have two models of har harvesting um, certain fish, um, and we can, can represent the number of um, the number of fish in that population, the population size in as a function of harvesting effort to be given by two different models. The first model, the equation looks like this. It's two times one minus H when H is less than or equal to one. And it is zero when H is greater than one. In model two, we've got N of H is a half times one plus the square root of nine minus h, eight h, if h is less than or equal to nine of eight, eight and zero otherwise. And so the question is, if we plot these, right, we want to see what the continuity properties of these two different models and where does extinction occur? Where can, can we have a sort of extinction event occurring? Um, in addition, we want to know what are the biological significance of the difference in the continuity between the models. So if we draw the graphs of these two um, equations, this is what it looks like. So, 
So this one here, we've got a, a sort of a straight line that decreases as, as H increases from zero to one, then it hits zero at one and it stays zero after that. In a similar way, notice the different, um, this is a, is a square root function, so it won't be a straight line, right? And that's what the curve of, of that function looks like. It sort of slopes, um, it doesn't have a straight line. Um, and then at, at a certain point, it just collapses to zero, is zero always after that, um, and at this point, yeah, there's a break in continuity, right? So you can see that. If you think about our intuitive description of continuity again, here we had to lift up the pen to continue drawing the graph of the function. In the first model, the function is continuous and a small increase in harvesting always causes a small decrease in the population size. So if the harvesting pressure is only increased by a small amount, we would be able to see extinction coming. And that's the point. For the other one, a small increase in harvesting causes a discontinuous collapse in the population size when H is equal to nine divided by eight. In such cases, a small increase in harvesting can cause a population to go extinct without warning. Right, so this is one sort of very simple example of how we can use calculus to avoid um, over harvesting a particular species. Let's look at some more definitions. So we said earlier that, um, I pointed out to you earlier that, um, in doing this limit calculation, the independent variable X can approach the point A either from the right or the left. So we have, have developed notation for this and I'm hoping you've seen this before. When I put a little plus to the right of the point where the, where the X is approaching. So in this case, X is approaching A and there's a little plus to the right of the A. That means that X is approaching A from the right of A. So the values of X are all larger than A, right? So a function F is continuous from the right at a number A if this equation holds and it is continuous from the left at the number A, if that equation holds. Similarly, if A with a little plus to the right means approach A from the right, then A with a little minus means approach A from the left, right? And so we can use this. Um, we can now look at our, one of our previous pictures and see how this makes um, and, and see an example of what we are talking about. So let's look at the number four. Yeah, this function is continuous, right? From the right at four, because the limit as X approaches four from the right is that value there, 24. The limit as X approaches four from the left is that number there, 28, can you see? And so this function is continuous as X approaches A from the four, uh, uh, as X approaches four from above, it is continuous at the right at four, but not continuous at the left at four. And similarly for these other numbers here, okay? Continuous from the right, but not from the left at each of the jump discontinuities. A function if is continuous on an interval. So up to now, we've spoken about continuity at a particular point. But if you, if you think of 
the real line, it consists of intervals. So I can think of the interval between one and two. And I can say that the function is continuous on that entire interval. If it is the case that the function is continuous at each point in that interval, right? If the interval, if it is defined only on one side of an endpoint of the interval, we understand continu continuous at the endpoint to mean continuous from the right to continuous from the left. <clears throat> Instead of using the definitions to verify the continuity of the function, it is often convenient to use the next theorem, which shows us how to build complicated continuous functions from simple ones. This theorem is, um, this theorem has an analogous theorem, which you probably, hopefully, saw earlier this week as well. And that was the theorem that said, if f is a function, and there, was, there were conditions re required of f to be a function, if f and g is a function, I can attach meaning to the symbol of f plus g. And if f is a function, and g is a function, and f plus g is a function. And if minus g is a function, and if times g is a function, and if divided by g is a function, and if multiplied by a constant number is also a function, okay? And this is your first exposure to what we call an algebra of functions. So now we, we start looking at functions as being almost like numbers, right? where we can add numbers, we can subtract them, we can divide them, and so on. And so this theorem says the next step up, not only is f plus g a function, but if f is a continuous function and g is a continuous function at any particular point a, then the sum of the two will also be continuous at a the difference of the two will be continuous at A. F and C will be continuous at A. F times G will be continuous at A. And lastly, F divided by G will be continuous at A if as long as we restrict to the denominator not being zero, okay? It follows from theorem four and theorem three that if f and g are continuous in an interval, then so are these functions that we've spoken about, are spoken about above. On an, on an entire interval, f plus g will be continuous if f is continuous on that interval and g is continuous on that interval. The same for the difference, the same for f times a constant, the same for the product and the same for the quotient of two continuous functions. So let's talk about which functions are continuous because at this point you've seen many functions already, right? So which of these functions that you've come across are continuous? Well, it turns out any polynomial is a continuous function everywhere where it is defined. So remember, a polynomial is an expression like um, x cubed plus 3x squared minus x plus a constant. A rational function is continuous wherever it is defined. What do we mean by a rational function? You'll, you'll remember a rational function is simply a polynomial divided by a polynomial, right? Any rational function is continuous where it's defined. So let's look at this. Suppose um, we look at the formula V of R is equal to four divided by three times pi R cubed, right? This formula gives us the volume of a sphere. So you can think of a soccer ball and you can measure the radius of that soccer ball right? 
then the volume of air contained inside the sphere is given by this formula. And notice that the four divided by three and pi are constants. They fixed numbers, right? Whereas the R is the variable. So there's the variable, it's the radius. The volume is given to be some number times the radius cubed. So this is in fact a polynomial function. And because it's a polynomial function, it is a continuously variable function. It's a continuous function. In the same way, if we, if we throw a ball vertically into the air with a velocity of 50 feet per second, then the height of the ball in feet, t seconds after it was thrown up, is given by this formula. Height is equal to 50 times t minus 16 t squared. Again, a function which is a polynomial. And polynomials we've seen in the previous theorem are continuous functions everywhere. Right. And the height is a continuous function of the elapsed time. So since, since we now understand what continuity is, we can do certain limit calculations very simple, in a very simple way. We can, for example, very simply calculate this expression. We can say the function um, f of x is equal to uh, equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 1 divided by 5 minus 3x. This is a rational function. And so it is continuous on its domain. Remember what the domain is here? It's simply the set of, the set of values wherever this denominator is not zero. So as long as that denominator is not zero, that's going to happen when x is equal to 5 over 3. Then this expression is continuous at any other x value. And so we can calculate this limit because we know that that expression is continuous. We can calculate the limit by simply evaluating the value of the function. That's exactly the definition of continuity. And so we can say the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this expression is the same as the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x which is just f at negative two, but that's simple. We simply plug in negative two into x and solve, and we get negative one over 11. And this is the power of knowing continuity, right? So let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk a little bit about um, trigonometric functions. So, um, the trigonometric functions play a very important role in your um, calculus one modules, depending on which one you do. So many of you listening um, right now will be doing the first year calculus module that takes you to, that allows you to do mathematics two and mathematics three, and that allows you to do um, engineering, for example. Um, in that case, you are definitely going to be using, going to be making a lot of use of these trigonometric functions, and um, they are key to many of the techniques that you learn in, in that calculus module. Okay, so let's talk about their continuity properties. So if you, if you, Cast your mind back to, to the sine and cosine curves that, you, that you've drawn up to now. Then um, if you think about it, you will notice, or if you think about what we've said, you will notice that they are continuous functions, right? They're continuous everywhere on their domain. And because they are continuous, because sine is continuous and cosine is continuous, and because tan of x is simply the ratio of these two, it's simply sine x divided by cosine x. This tan x must also be continuous, except where cosine, is, cosine of x is zero. 
right? And so it turns out that that is correct. And so we can see that because you know the shape of the tan graph as well. Okay, so now if you look at this curve, you will notice that the values of x are written in a way that you have not seen them before. So at this point, I'm going to introduce you very briefly, and it will probably be the last thing that we talk about since I've got about five minutes left, if I'm correct. Um, um, in, I'm going to introduce you to a, a, an alternative way in which we measure angle in calculus one, and that's called the radian. And so it turns out that for purposes of calculus, it is better if we use this radian measure of angle to measure angles. And it, it's a simple thing. There's a simple translation, simple way of translating degrees, which is what you have been are familiar with and I've been doing trig trigonometry with, um, measuring angles with. There's a simple way of, tr of translating a, uh, an angle measured in degrees to its corresponding measure in radians. And so if you look at this, you'll notice that, well, in this case, zero degrees is the same as zero radians. And then this occurs at 90 degrees. So this first asymptote for the tan curve, you'll remember from school, occurs when the angle X is equal to 90 degrees. And the tan curve cuts through the X axis when X is equal to 180 degrees. And so you can read it off there. So, um, pi by two radians. So yeah, the measure, the angle is, is given in radians. So pi by two radians is the same as 90 degrees. Pi radians is the same as um, 180 degrees. Three pi by two, 270 degrees and so on, right? And so um, you will come across this radian measure depending on which of these modules you, you take. If you take the, the modules that lead you to a BSc, in other words, Mathematics 2, Mathematics 3, or the mathematics you need for engineering, then you will definitely be um, exposed to this alternative way of measuring an angle called radians. So uh, trigonometric functions are continuous mostly, obviously at these points here, 90 degrees or pi by two radians, the tan function is not continuous, but everywhere else it is. So on that interval there, the tan function is continuous. The exponential function y is equal to b to the power x is a continuous function. Um, the inverse function for any continuous one-to-one -one function is also continuous. The graph of the inverse of x of f is obtained by reflecting the graph of f about the line y equals x. And so the graph of f, if the graph of f has no break in it, neither does the graph of its inverse. The function y is equal to log to the base b of x is continuous on this interval here, zero infinity, because it is the inverse of the function y is equal to b to the power x, right? There's another theorem. The following types of functions are continuous at every number in their domain. Polynomials, rational functions, power and root functions, trigonometric functions, exponential functions, logarithmic functions. Where is the function? This is probably going to be our last example. In fact, I'm not sure I will be able to complete it. Where is the function f of x is equal to ln x plus e to the x um, uh, divided by x squared minus one 
continuous. In fact, at this stage, I'm just going to stop quickly and see if I have any. Um, no, so there are no questions in the chat. I was meant to check that earlier. I will go back to full screen mode in a second. Yeah, there are no questions in the chat, so I will simply continue. Ah, wait, now there is one. No questions on Facebook, so that is perfect. I will continue and someone will tell me when to stop. Um, okay, so let's see how far we get with this example. So, so here we've got um, obviously um, the sum of two functions in the numerator. We've got a polynomial in the denominator. And so we've got this quotient of functions. We know from theorem six that the function y is equal to ln x is continuous when x is positive. And y is equal to e to the x is continuous on the whole of the set of real numbers. By part one of our theorem four, y equals ln x plus e to the x is continuous on the set of all positive reals. The denominator, y is equal to x squared minus one is a polynomial. And so it is continuous everywhere, which is the entire set of real numbers. Therefore, by part five of one of our theorems, f is continuous at all positive numbers, except where this expression is zero, right? wherever the denominator is zero. So f is continuous on the intervals zero, one, and one infinity. So all we've done is really take out this point here, this positive solution to this expression. And that's where that function is continuous. Another example. Let's evaluate the limit as x approaches pi. Again, pi is the number pi you know. It's 3.14, whatever. Okay, It's the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. The limit as x approaches pi of sine x divided by 2 plus cosine x. Again, we're going to use the continuity properties of these functions. Theorem six tells us that y equal to sine x is continuous. The function in the denominator, y is equal to two plus cosine x, is the sum of two continuous functions and therefore it is continuous. So the two plus cos x, that's a continuous function. Numerator, that's a continuous function. Notice that this function is never zero because cosine of x is always greater than or equal to negative one. And so the two plus cosine x, I can look at this expression and simply add a two on the left of this inequality and a two on the right of this inequality. And I get the fact that two plus cos x is greater than or equal to plus one, which means two plus cosine x is greater than zero everywhere. So this expression can never be zero. And so the ratio, f of x is equal to sine x divided by two plus cos x is continuous everywhere. Remember, this would have been discontinuous only in the case where the denominator is zero, but the denominator can never be zero. And so this expression is continuous everywhere. Okay, and so by what we mean by, the con by a continuous function, we can simply calculate this limit now by plugging in pi into these values. And so the limit as x approaches pi of sine x divided by two plus cos x is the limit as x approaches pi of f of x, which is f at pi, which is sine of pi divided by two plus cos pi. Now, you need to cast your mind back to what I explained to you about the radian measure. 
remember that pi radians is the same as 180 degrees. And so sine of pi is the same as sine of 180, which is zero. Cosine of 180 is minus one. And so that limit calculates to zero. Okay. Um, seems like we are continuing. Another way of combining continuous functions f and g to get a new continuous function is to form a composite function, a function of a function, right? And so we have this theorem that says if f is a con if f is continuous at a point b and the limit as x approaches a of g of x is b, then the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is f of b. In other words, the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is f of the limit of g of x as x approaches a. So notice what we've done. We've taken this limit expression and moved it to inside the bracket. So we've taken the f and moved it out there. That's simply what this theorem is saying. And notice there are conditions that this f must be continuous at the point B. So it must be continuous at, at that point there. Remember B is just a different way of writing that limit, right? It's the same thing. Intuitively, this theorem is reasonable because if x is close to A, then G of x is close to B. And since f is continuous at b, if g of x is close to b, then f of g of x must be close to f of b. Right, that makes sense. Remember, this notion of closeness is exactly what continuity wishes to, is, is exactly what continuity is about. And our formal definition is is a way of making mathematically precise this notion of, of closeness, right, of smallness. If G is continuous at A and F is continuous at G of A, then the composite function, F composed with G given by F composed with G at X is F of G of X is continuous at A. And it's often expressed informally by saying a continuous function of a continuous function is a continuous function. Let's look at another example. We are the following functions continuous. H of X is equal to sine of X squared. F of X is equal to ln of one plus cos X. We can rewrite that h of x to be the composition of two functions. So we can have h of x is f of g of x, where g of x is x squared and f of x is sine of x, right? So if you look at that h, x goes into it. Yeah, x squared goes into sine. So we first have to square. So if you think about it, this happens first. We put x into a machine that returns the square of the number. So x goes in, x, squares, x squared comes out. Then that x squared is passed to another machine, the machine called sine, right? So h of x is the same as f of g of x, where the g of x is the square function and the f of x is the sine function. Right, it makes sense. And so now we can say g is continuous on the set of real numbers since it is a polynomial and f is also continuous everywhere. And thus we get that f composed with g is continuous on R by our previous example uh, theorem. Eight. What about b? We know that the lin function is continuous and that one plus cosine x is continuous because both y equals one and y equals cos x are continuous. 
Therefore, by our theorem, F composed with G is continuous wherever it is defined. Now, the ln of one plus cos x is defined when one plus cos x is positive. Remember that the ln function is defined only for positive real numbers. And so it is undefined when x is equal to negative one, because when x is negative one, the side will become equal to zero. It won't be greater than zero anymore. And this happens when, again, in radian measure, this will happen when x is plus or minus 180 degrees, plus or minus three pi, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that's what that curve looks like for um, um, the discontinuities of f. Okay, and that's what I have for you today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think I was supposed to talk until seven, unless there's something I didn't understand. I'm going to stop sharing. And can someone please tell me if I'm correct or if I've missed something? Yeah, we're all good. We've gone off live now, uh, Doctor. Ah, okay. So um, yeah, I can stop talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I hope that went okay. Yeah, Makanana, do you want to come through? Makanana. All right, Doc, I think you might have uh, some technical difficulties, but uh, thank you so much for your time. It, okay. it was a great lesson and we are going to share it on our U, uh, YouTube page as well. So we'll be able to get some good mileage out of this great lesson. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, you guys too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Lefuno. Yes. Can we then make sure we arrange again for tomorrow to do the same thing? Uh, get one at half past and make sure everything uh, uh, runs smoothly. So I think today's one, it went well. Yes, yes. I will, yeah. I will set up the reminders uh, tomorrow in the afternoon and towards half past five so that people can get ready. Maybe I'll send, I'll send the reminders around 20 past five so that by half past five we're all here and then we could to go